Aum. Nano padiva shadeva jati varna shramadaya atman yaro pitas toye rasavarnadi bhedavat. Nana upadivashat, because of association with different upadis. Eva only. Jati varna ashram adayaha, caste, color, position, etc. Atmani, upon the Atman, aropitaha, are superimposed. Toye, on water. Rasavarna Adi Bhedavat, differences such as flavor, color, etc. Owing to its association with various conditioning upadis, such ideas as caste, color, and position are superimposed on Atman, as flavor, color, and so forth are superimposed on water. Namaste. So, in the last episode, we went into the Mula Pariyaya, the program that runs at a root level in the mind, creating the false ego by false identification with external sense objects conceived of as mine. Today, we're going to do a deep dive into superimposition, adhyasa which is another similar unconscious program running in the mind that causes the identification of the self and the body, among other things. So I have to warn you before we start, your mind does not want you to hear this. It's very likely that during the rest of this video, you may get a strong irrational urge to click away. Do not pay any attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> Don't listen to it. Uh, be like Toto. <laughs> Pull aside the curtain and see what's really going on deep in the mind. Adhyasa, superimposition a condensation of Shankaracharya's preamble to his commentary on the Brahma Sutras. What is superimposition? It is a perception similar to memory arising on a different or foreign substrate, resulting in the appearance of one thing as something else. For example, we find in common experience that mother of pearl appears as silver, a rope appears as a snake, water appears in the desert, the body appears as the self, etc. How can there be superimposition of any object or its attributes on the inmost self, Brahman, that is opposed to the non-self, matter, and is never an object of the senses and mind? The self is not absolutely beyond apprehension because it is apprehended as the content of the concept I, and because the self is well known in the world as an immediately perceived self-revealing entity. That is, the self is known as I to all people, learned or ignorant, and nobody has any doubt about this. This superimposition of the body on the self is considered by the learned to be avidya, nations, and ascertainment of the nature of the real entity by separating the superimposed thing from it by viveka, discrimination, is called vidya, knowledge or illumination, leading to jnana, self-realization. It is an established fact that the subject and the object, the contents of the concepts I and that, respectively, are by nature as contradictory as light and darkness, and cannot logically have any identity. Thus, the superimposition of the object, referable through the concept that, and its attributes, on the subject, 
that is conscious by nature and is referable through the concept I should be impossible. Contrarily, superimposition of the subject and its attributes on the object should be impossible. Nevertheless, owing to an absence of discrimination between substances and their attributes that are absolutely disparate, there continues a natural human behavior based on self-identification in the form of I am this and this is mine. This behavior has for its material cause an unreal nescience. People resort to it by mixing up reality with unreality as a result of superimposing the things themselves or their attributes on each other. However, superimposition of one thing on another does not affect the locus in any way. All forms of worldly and Vedic behavior connected with valid means of knowledge and objects of knowledge start by assuming this mutual superimposition of the self and non-self known as nescience. And so do all the scriptures dealing with injunction and prohibition, karma kanda, or emancipation, jnana kanda. How can the means of valid knowledge, such as direct perception and the scriptures, have as their locus a cognizer who is subject to nescience? Vedanta's answer is, a man without self-identification with the body, mind, senses, etc., cannot become a cognizer. The means of knowledge cannot function for him. Since perception and other activities of a man are impossible without accepting the senses, etc., as his own, since the senses cannot function without the body as a basis, since nobody engages in any activity with a body without the idea of the self superimposed on it, since the unrelated empirical self cannot become a cognizer unless there is mutual superimposition of the self the body and their attributes on each other. And since the means of knowledge cannot function unless there is a cognizer, therefore it follows that the means of knowledge, such as direct perception as well as the scriptures, must have as their locus a man who is subject to nations. Thus, even the scriptures, which operate before the dawn of real knowledge of the self, cannot transgress the limits of dependence on people groping in ignorance. And since superimposition means the cognition of something as some other thing, one thinks, I am a man, I am a woman, etc. Thus one superimposes external qualities on the self. Similarly, one first superimposes the internal organ, possessing the idea of ego on the self, the witness of all the manifestations of that organ. Then, by an opposite process, one superimposes that self, which is opposed to the non-self, and which is the witness of everything, on the internal organ. Because of this mutual superimposition, the mind and body appear to be conscious and active, although they are but dull, inert matter. Superimposition has neither beginning nor end, but flows on eternally. It appears as the manifested universe and its apprehension, conjures up agency, acquisition, and enjoyership, and is perceived by all persons. Study of the Upanishads and Vedanta is meant to eradicate this source of delusion, reveal the nature of the embodied soul as identical with Brahman, and facilitate direct knowledge of the unity of the self through self-realization. This is the purport of all the Upanishads. And that's the condensed version. <laughs> the first time I read this in the introduction to the Brahma Sutras, I went, this guy is from another planet. <laughs> Shankaracharya displays intelligence beyond human. 
in really all of his works, but especially the commentary on the Brahma Sutras, Vedanta Sutras, as they're sometimes called. He, it's like he pulls out all the stops and reveals how he really thinks. And how he thinks, I mean, just to read it, just to comprehend it, you'll probably have to listen to this several times, demands an attention span way greater than the normal human being possesses, especially these days. Uh, but if you read the original, I mean, it's even more erudite, more esoteric, and more difficult. <laughs> I had to really dumb it down to fit it into two pages. <laughs> so anyway, superimposition means seeing one thing for another thing. The example of the rope and snake is perfect. One actually sees a rope, but thinks of it as a snake and projects this conception based on memory onto the actual perception. Now, this is not only the case in the rope and snake, this is the case in our everyday life. We go through the day thinking, I am this body, or maybe not thinking it directly, but assuming it as a background. That it is commonly accepted that the body is superimposed on the self and vice versa. So when one says, I am hungry, I am cold, Huh? I am sitting in the chair making a video. <laughs> We're really talking about the body. But it's more awkward to say, I have positioned my body in the chair in front of the camera for the purposes of making a video. It sounds really awkward. It sounds like, like something Data would say, you know, in Star Trek. But actually, this is the case. I remember my Adi Guru, Srila Prabhupada, the first thing that he would teach all of his disciples is, you are not this body. You are the self, the Atman, different from the body. And even after many years, most of his disciples didn't get it. And they conceived of themselves in terms of a body, that has a certain title or designation or position in an organization and so forth. And I think one of the reasons is that he never explained in detail the mechanism of superimposition, as Shankaracharya did in the excerpt we just read. Sometimes it's helpful to hear all the technical details to understand how something happens, especially when it's a process that's going on in the mind all by itself at a deep level of subconscious awareness. So it's good to peer under the hood and see how all these things work. And that's one of the premises of this series and many other series that we've done to pull aside the curtain, uh, open the hood, and see what's going on underneath in the mechanism of the mind. And this yields rich, deep insights into the nature of human existence, consciousness, and the path to full enlightenment. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.